our scriptures today. Our first one is from Genesis 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Our second scripture comes from the book of 1 John, the third chapter, the first and second verses. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when He is revealed, We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. For a third reading, we'll turn to the Old Testament, the 124th Psalm. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled by against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. During my time here with you as pastor, we've spent a lot of time during our sermons and our services looking at what we are called to be as the church and who we are called to be as disciples of Christ and what that looks like in our life. But over the next few weeks, I want to look more closely at what it is that we believe. What are the core foundational beliefs that we hold as people of Christ that compel us to do all of those other things that we talked about, right? We're called to be disciples of Christ, but if we don't know why, it doesn't matter. We need to be able to tell people what we believe. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at theology. Now, when I say the word theology and the fact that we're going to be talking about it for three weeks... This might be your reaction. It's not a word that generally engenders a great response, right? Because it just doesn't sound interesting. It sounds boring. It sounds difficult. Okay? But what is theology? And it's based, theology is very simple. It's being able to say what we believe and why we believe it. And that's an important thing for us to be able to do as the church. Because if somebody comes up to you and asks you on the street what it is that you believe, I don't want you to look at them like this. I want you to be able to tell them what we believe as Christians. What goes on in that place? What is it that you stand upon? And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at our theology. And we're going to be doing it through the lens of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to be looking at what it means to believe in God the Father. And this is an important conversation to have with theology because all of our theology starts with Scripture. But the reality that we have is as people, we can read Scripture and come up with different understandings, right? You can read a verse to people and have completely different takeaways from the Scripture that exists there. I'm going to bring this up from a couple years ago. This thing is simply called the dress. Those of you who were active on social media two years ago might remember that this was a thing. Now, what makes this interesting is that there are those of you who look at the screen and raise your hands if you see a blue dress with black lines on it. Okay. Raise your hand if you see a gold dress with white lines on it. Yeah. Now, I am a blue and black line person. Blue dress with black lines. I think if you look at this picture and you see a gold dress with white lines, you're some kind of crazy person. Because it's very obvious that that is a blue dress with black lines. Yep, and yet, 
Those of you who see a gold dress with white lines are looking at me and saying, Pastor, you're even crazier than I already thought you were because that is obviously a gold dress with white lines. That's crazy, isn't it? That we can look through human eyes at this dress and see two completely different things. There's a whole lot of science. They've done far too much research about this, in my opinion. But there's a lot of things I don't understand. It'd be like Dwayne talking at the beginning of the service. I don't really know. All I know is we see different things, right? But I think it's an important way for us to understand. Sometimes Scripture can be like this, right? We can, two people can read Scripture and come away with a different understanding of that Scripture. So when we talk about creating theology... John Wesley talked about different things we need to bring into that conversation. He talked about bringing in our experience, right? We all experience God throughout our lives that it helps us to understand Scripture, the things that we go through. Reason, God gave us brains so that we could use them, even though we don't a lot of the times. We use our reason to help us understand Scripture and our tradition. How have the people who have come before us read the scripture? How have they understood it as a church and as the United Methodist Church? And when we put those three things together with scripture, we get theology out. In theological terms, they call this thing the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So there's your big seminary term for the day. And so we understand scripture through that lens. And we interpret it. And so what we're going to talk today are what are some of the core theological beliefs that we come away with that we all can agree upon as children of God. And the first one is where we started in Genesis. This idea that God the Father is the creator. That God has worked and God has created us. In my last church... I was a couple of months into my ministry there, very similar to where I am here. And they didn't have any Bible studies going on. So I decided I was going to start a Bible study on a nice, easy book. We're going to do Genesis. It's a lot of stories, a lot of crazy people to make fun of in Genesis. It's a good time, right? A lot of conversation. So we start from the first lesson. And things started going wrong. You see, we read this creation story. It just happened in that Bible study, I had one person who was a biology professor at the local university. And this man believed unequivocally through the research he had done and the learning through his life that the process of creation was one of evolution. That God worked through an evolutionary process and that is where we have, how we have arrived at where we are today. And then there was another woman in our class who was raised in a very different way. And had a very different set of beliefs. And she believed, similarly, unequivocally, that creation was done in six 24-hour periods. And that was it. That's what the Bible says. And if you question it, you are completely wrong. And I don't want to talk to you anymore. I had these two people in a Bible study. And they started going at it. And I got really concerned. Because I thought someone was going to kill the other person. And then nobody wants to come to the church where people are dying in the Bible studies. So I asked them. This is what I said. I said, okay, let's try to come to some kind of middle ground here. I asked the one person. I said, who created the world? They said, well, God did. I'm like, all right. And I turned to the other one. I said, who created the world? God did. I'm like, all right. They still weren't real happy with each other by the end of the class. But we talked about how we got to that truth, that moment that we realize when we look around us that God has created everything, that there was nothing. And then God made something in each and every one of us. Have you all had that moment sometime in your life where you see something in creation and you have that sort of epiphany that only God could have created this? Right? Maybe for some of you it was a big moment, right? Maybe you went to the Grand Canyon or you went to Niagara Falls and you saw something huge and massive and said, this must be God. 
Maybe for some of you it was something small. It was just the beauty in a flower or an insect. You know, there are no flowers in my house. They all, I kill them all. But maybe that's your moment. Maybe it's something small and tiny where you said, God is in that. God must have made that, right? Maybe it was a moment when you were looking into the eyes of the person that you love and you said, only God could have created something as perfect as this person. Guys, that's a good one to go with. (laughs) Who said said the Bible wasn't romantic, right? Absolutely. Truth is romantic. But there's a moment, right? There's a moment. I hope you've had that. If you haven't, take time to look around. Look at the creation around you because God is present in everywhere. And that is the truth that we're told in Scripture. That's what Scripture tells us. At its core is that everything that exists is because of God. You exist today because God willed you and created you. You have life because God gave it to you. And that person out there who doesn't believe in the existence of God has the ability to make that choice because God gave it to them. God has created everything we believe that as a church we believe that as a people of god that we are here because we are created by god everything we experience is created by god because god didn't stop at the creation right god is creating life each and every moment of every day if we just look around us and see it god is always creating That is our belief. That is who we are. But luckily, God did not create us and then just let us go. God continued to be with us. Now, how many of you are from a generation where you utilized one of these buildings at your home? All right. Younger people? Not that you're not. All right. I'm digging holes. All right. Notice, this is an outhouse. I have a fun story about an outhouse. There was a young man, young boy, who lived in the country, and in his house they had an outhouse that he had to go out to. Now, he hated the outhouse. It was cold in the winter, it was hot in the summer, and it always smelled no matter what time of year it was. And so he decided one day he was going to get rid of that outhouse because he hated it. Luckily, at his, it was located right beside the creek in the back of his house. So one day he put his hands on the outhouse and he shoved and he knocked the whole outhouse into the creek and it started floating away. Later that night, his father came to him and asked him to accompany him out to the woodshed. Now, people from the outhouse generation, which is not a, I'm not going to say that again. That doesn't sound a nice way to put it. The people that raise your hands, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, it's not usually a good thing, right? And so the boy knew this and he asked his father what he had done. And his father said, well, somebody, somebody pushed the outhouse over. And I have a feeling it was you. And the boy admitted he said yes, but he said to his father, he said, you know, when George Washington told the truth about chopping down the cherry tree, he didn't get in trouble. And his father looked at him, he said, you know, that's true, son. But when George Washington chopped down the cherry tree, his father wasn't inside it when he did it. I tell that story not just to be gross. I tell that story because I think it shows us something that we see in scripture about what our relationship with God the Father is. We read in 1 John here where it says that we are children of God. And that's why we use this understanding of God as our Father. Now, we all didn't have the same relationships growing up with our fathers, right? Some people don't even have relationships with their fathers or some people didn't have the relationship that God would want us to have. But when we say God the Father, we talk about that relationship as it should be. One of love. One of correction when necessary. And the story we told, obviously the boy is about to serve some consequences for, this, for what he did. In the same way when we read scripture, we are children of God. But God is just, right? And there are consequences to our actions. Because again, we're very much like the boy that pushed over the outhouse, right? God did all this wonderful stuff for us, created the world, gave us all those things we just talked about. And Adam and Eve went and did what? Screwed it up. 
They pushed the outhouse over with God in it. And then we continue to do that, right? We continue to turn from God. We continue to make mistakes. And there are consequences to that, right? Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is what? Death, right? But luckily God offers us salvation through Jesus Christ. God offers us forgiveness, right? There's a way forth from that. And that's what we see in this, in this story. Just as the father is going to do some sort of discipline on the son, we assume that the son is going to return from the woodshed. That he's still going to be the son afterwards. In the same way, even though we make mistakes, even though we turn We are always children of God. God continues to love us in a way that goes beyond our understanding, goes beyond our imagining, goes beyond anything that we can comprehend. And that is at the core of our beliefs, that we are children of God. And that God loves us and cherishes us. And while God is just, His love burns beyond that goes beyond the punishment. And that is how we have Jesus. That is why we were offered salvation through Christ. And the final point that we learn in these scriptures about God the Father is that God is our refuge. Earlier this summer, there was a moment where my children were all outside playing and they found a caterpillar. It was one of those fuzzy ones. And Joanna, my oldest, decided it was going to be her job to defend the caterpillar at all cost. Right? So every time one of her sisters came rolling up on a tricycle, she, she'd block them out around the caterpillar. Right? When the caterpillar was going somewhere it shouldn't, she'd get a little leaf and she'd guide it the way it was supposed to go to keep it away from danger. She did this for a half an hour of just watching after this caterpillar. And then a fateful moment happened. Then all of a sudden, Heather called from inside and said, it's time for lunch. And Joanna, in her excitement to go get her sandwich, stepped and the caterpillar was no more. And Joanna, Joanna freaked out for like a half hour over this. All right, she lost it because this thing that she had spent all this time protecting and being there for was now just sort of a smear on our sidewalk. Now, I am here to tell you the wonderful truth about Scripture is that in one way, God is very much like my young daughter. I'm also here to tell you the wonderful truth that in one very special way, God is not at all like my daughter. Right? And that's what we see in Scripture when we read the Psalms here in 124 and in so many other Psalms. And we see this theme repeated throughout Scripture is that God is our refuge and that God is our strength. Right? God is watching over us, loving us, caring for us. And we believe that, right? God didn't just start the world and then let it go and just see what happened. God is active and God is at work. That's why we come here and we have our prayer time. Because we believe that God has the ability and does heal people. That God does answer prayer. God is my daughter that is protecting us from the things of this world. Who is guiding us where we need to go. But the wonderful truth about scripture is that God will not step on us and squish us. But rather, God will defend us from the things of this world if we place our trust in God. That God is active. God isn't just sitting up there waiting until we get there. God is here in this place, living in our hearts and within us. That is what it means to have God the Father. God the Father gave us life. God the Father has claimed us as His own. And God the Father continues each and every day to work on our behalf. That is what it is to understand God through God the Father. And we're going to talk as we go forth in the next couple weeks about Jesus. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And of course we celebrate the Trinity, God three in one. Which is an incredibly hard concept to teach. Right, Daryl? You echo that as a pastor? Right. It's a hard concept to teach. 
You ever try to teach it to children? It's real tough. And it's a mystery that we'll never fully understand, but it's amazing nonetheless that God can be there in so many ways and means so much to us. And so go forth this day knowing that God has given you the gift of life and the gift of the world in which you live. Go forth knowing that you are a child of God because God has claimed you as one. And go forth knowing that God is watching over you, that God is defending you, that God is with you. And go forth living your life with that kind of joy so that the people who don't have someone watching out for them and that haven't realized the love that God wants to pour out upon them would see it through you and within you and come to that knowledge so that they, if they ask you, what is it that you believe that makes you so darn happy all the time? You can tell them, I have God who has created you and has created all of us with me, living within me, and watching over me. That's what I believe. Would you bow your heads? Lord, I thank you for each and every person gathered here. I thank you for how you have worked in their hearts and are continuing to do so. Lord, give us that strength and that joy that comes with the knowledge that you are with us. Lord, don't go, let us go out into the world scared, afraid, worried, but Lord, feeling powerful and mighty for you are with us. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would be at work in our hearts. Help our faith to grow. Help us to change lives. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen.